So lecture 60 is the beginning of the last few lectures in which we want to fill in some of the things that we are missing uh, to finish our understanding of the uh, of the 230 end, you know, what you get at the end with these 230 uh, space groups. And uh, we mentioned in the last lecture, screw axes need to be covered, and we're going to show you how you generate that in 3D, uh, because we'll take the model clinic and we'll add the uh, two-fold axis in a particular way and see and see what happens. And then we'll just discuss the uh, three uh, threefold uh, screw axis, which starts to generalize it. And then we'll have a following lecture where we talk about the fourfold axis and then draw some general conclusions uh, from that. So recall that the monolithic case, uh, where it's a lattice that has a general angle down in the bottom, but then has these sides that are perpendicular to the base. So we have these right angles here, but this angle is general. And uh, the links can be any links. There doesn't have to be any extra symmetry in any of the uh, links. So uh, we mentioned in our table of lattices that the Lowy group is uh, 2 over m. Uh, and we get that automatically from having translations that work with adding a two-fold axis. And remember the base that we start off with when we add a two-fold axis at the lattice points is uh, the P2. So the simplest thing that we end up with is, of course, a P2 because all we do is translate up with T3 like that. And then we end up with essentially just another layer above this one, if I had drawn that correctly. Um, just another layer above where all these guys just pass right through, making it compatible with the symmetry elements, right? So the this guy passes right through, this guy passes right through, this guy passes right through. And so that's the, the simplest case, and, and of course we would call that big uh, P2. And we won't rederive it, but we had shown you that the other choices are to actually go over and, and be above one of these uh, two-fold axes on the side, or to be above the one in the center, and both those produce a a bodied centered cell. Now before we talk about that, because that's actually how we get the uh, screw axes, uh, I wanted to uh, discuss a little bit notation. Uh, what we try to do in most crystal structures is that the C axis uh, is the unique axis and then uh, the other two axes uh, B is greater than A. Okay, so in this case, all those two-fold axes are going up. We would tend to want to call this the C direction. Then you would call, you know, this direction A. And this B, B is greater than A, you can uh, see here. So that would be kind of the convention. Uh, now, there's only two lattices. The primitive one I'm showing over here. But now let's look more closely uh, at 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 the bodied centered one uh, because uh, we have to think about the motifs. We haven't done that yet. So we already described how, actually I like to use black for this. We already described how I end up with, and remember the base is this parallelogram. We end up with a lattice point in the middle, and that's the uh, I version because I had a T3 coming up here, right? And we did a redefinition where we did two T3, and then remember, as long as we're doing whole translations, it's just revealing 
the atom arrangement. The atom, imagine the atom arrangement's already there, compatible with this T3. All we're doing is saying, oh yeah, I'm going up to this other one, translating back, and there is a lattice point there. I'm just going to redefine this whole thing, putting that one uh, in the middle. So we haven't talked about is the details of what this means in terms of new combination theorems. So remember that this T, this new translation 3, is 1 half A plus 1 half B plus 1 half C. After all, it's in the center of the lattice and we must recognize that in this case this is perpendicular and this is parallel. In other words, if I were to break this down into two components, I'd have a, an in-plane one here, which would be perpendicular, and then I'd have an out-of-plane one here, which is parallel, and this is the recall the C uh, direction. So uh, you can tell what's coming here is that uh, we kind of think based on our previous work, remember that if I have an element of a twofold axis here, with an a-pi rotation, and I have a perpendicular uh, translation to it, remember that it induced other another b-pi uh, rotation. Recall that's how come we ended up here, because it did it at half t perpendicular in 2D. So along this line, remember if I had two of these guys, or sorry, just one of them actually, an a-pi here, and this is t perpendicular, and oh, sorry, this is t perpendicular, and it and, and it ha it made it that it was x equals zero, which means that this thing was sitting right in the middle. That's how come we knew that we had a, a twofold axis. So if I have something at a lattice site here, a lattice site here, we know that there has to be a twofold axis uh, in the middle. So remember, that's what we're seeing here. I have a pi and I have a translation vector. And so you might say, ah, you know, we have to have uh, some sort of um, possible uh, other B pi rotation. So just to remind you, uh, we had that the combination theorem from before, from before is if I had a A pi rotation and I had a translation that induced a, another equivalent a rotation at one half t perpendicular. So it's a little more complicated because we're in 3D and we want to look at that particular case. So remember what we're doing now is we're seeing what happens actually when I have this twofold axis. We said without kind of finishing it that clearly I could move into the I could t have a third translation which goes above and sits above this twofold axis in the middle, and I show that makes a bodied center, and actually the the side center is the same; it's a bodied center. And but I didn't go I didn't go any further. Now we're going to go further, and we're going to say, ah, you know, let's draw some motifs and and see uh, what that actually does. So let me erase my pen because I'm running out of digital space, and let's redraw this. So let's have our vector this time coming out at us, going to another lattice point. And let's have our rotation axis be right there, right? And We'll just draw in a little projection. Let's keep it in black, actually. Let's draw this thing coming out. 
this thing going up. So, and I already mentioned that this was t perpendicular, one half a plus one half b. Okay, so that's just a, a redrawing. Now let's put in our motifs. Let's put in our famous little red commas, and then I want to rotate through the middle, right? But imagine that before I actually place this down, and this is right-handed, this is right-handed, but before I place it down, I translate that up here, and it stops somewhere around here. It's also right-handed. So, um, here we have one, two, three, and the question becomes, well, one and three must be related by a rotation or something like that because uh, there is no inversion that has converted it into a left-handed or a mirror plane, which has uh, created it, uh, converted it into a, a left-handedness. So it's, it's, it's a rotation. And um, so clearly, I haven't, uh, I'm not going to be able to use anything except for uh, rotation and translation. And that's where, uh, if you look closely at this thing, you can see that uh, this is um, creating a axis in the middle here. At one half t perpendicular, and I have an object to the left here. And what I've done is I uh, rotate it about this axis and then translate it up t parallel. So if I redraw that over here looking in from a different perspective. What I have is, let's say, rotate around 180 degrees, move up T parallel, Move up to parallel. So it's analogous to, that should be the same distance, by the way. So it's analogous to a, uh, a uh, glide operation, except that uh, we're not uh, mirroring, we're rotating and translating. So this is a screw axis, but let's uh, clean up our screen. and uh, just write down something a little more clearly without pixelization. So our new operation T, which is actually T perpendicular plus T parallel, as we have previously shown recently on the slides, equals a B pi which is at uh, one half t perpendicular as before, but we write that it's tau is now t parallel. Right, so very similar, except now that we have this, uh, this uh, screw axis. Now, how do we draw that operation? The operation is written as a alpha tau. And the symbol 
is sort of a two-fold axis with these wings or these flyers that you can imagine this thing spinning around and these things uh, swirling around and so that's how you draw a uh, a screw axis so that's it for a uh, two-fold axis but now we want to generalize this so let's look at a uh, three-fold axis so first let me draw so there's our our screw or sorry our well our screw axis with the uh, threefold axes now this gets a little bit harder to picture so I'm going to draw it uh, first so there's 120 degrees or uh, 2 pi over 3 and what what we're trying to do is show that you know what is really going on here is that you know we would have a um, a motif here right and we would rotate over to here and then without placing it down it gets translated up by tau and then it would be rotated back over to this side and then without placing it down it gets it up by tau and you can see that if I were to draw the circle here and the circle that this guy's on, this would be tau. And the circle that this guy's on, this should be tau too. Right? You can see what's going on there. Now, what we can do is say, look, um, you know, drawing these things is going to be kind of difficult. So just to see the symmetry patterns, instead of trying to do this, uh, what we can do is actually uh, break these up into um, these thirds and when we have something in this segment we'll represent it by uh, a solid block so for example here we'll say aha um, there's this first segment with nothing in it over here from this dash line to here that would be open and th this one here however has a motif in it if I come over here so I'd color this one in and then I would, I would uh, rotate around let's say onto the other side and look at the next segment and then rotate up and so there'd be a segment here and that would be colored in because there'd be a motif in there and so in that way if I were to unroll this unroll this um, uh, this shape you would have something that looks like this so again imagine that I have this so that's how I would write it so here this is just three but this would be a 2 pi over 3 comma tau because it's a rotation axis so this would be going up uh, the middle here and the way that I'm representing this notation and this is derived from uh, Bernie Vench's technique which he claimed came from another another student 
but um, so again imagine that this used to be a rolled up cylinder around here so here I had a motif in the original position here I rotate over translate up and I have another motif I rotate another 120 degrees so this to this represents 360 degrees or uh, 2 pi and so it's divided into thirds because that's the uh, type of screw axis so again I have a motif here I rotate 120 degrees go up one tau I rotate another 120 degrees go up one tau I rotate another 120 degrees go up one tau I ro rotate another 120 grow up one tau and so you can see that the pattern just like these guys here you see this thing goes up like that like a spiral and the spiral is very easily observed um, here another notation uh, to represent this is that I have been showing you tau equals one third t which corresponds to it's basically going uh, in the first rotation of 120 degrees and then I go one third t and of course there's another third t that means that indeed when I get up to here this equals T which it should right so again I it's because I'm I'm rotating and slipping up a one third T which is the tau component and then I rotate another in that and now remember all that has to happen is eventually I have to come back uh, this uh, original T we'll come back to this uh, in a second so this made sense because we're thinking all right I'm gonna go 120 degrees each time and then after that you know my tau should match up because I've you know dropped a comma on each one and then it's got to be translationally symmetric but the only restriction I have is that some integral number of tau equals some integral number of t so in other words my taus are inherently limited to a fraction of the translation for, uh, vector n, m over n right tau could equal 0t which is the trivial solution it could equal one third t which is the case that we've been working on but it could also be two thirds t because even though that doesn't end uh, within one t it'll line up within a couple of t right uh, so um, uh, the or a few t and so um, actually uh, another trivial solution is I could have a full T but of course that is uh, just reproducing uh, after one translation but then I, I just keep on going so I could have a four-thirds uh, T etc but the but you remember this is once you take a T out of it this is one-third T so the number of unique solutions because once you reach T if I take it out of each one of these it's still a third of a T up so the only unique solutions are here and this one is the one that doesn't have um, any uh, screw it just goes straight up so you know that way you can find your unique uh, uh, ones that we have to look at so tau could equal one third T or two thirds T because these other ones are just multiples uh, of those so of course how do we to find this then the answer is we use the notation you saw on the uh, international charts so this one is 3 1 and this one is 3 2 this one of course is the base case which is 3 
zero, and we usually don't have to write the zero. We just show a threefold axis, and we don't bother to put the uh, the zero there. So this is a meaningless thing. We just draw a three. So three one would be a third, a third, a third, and I'm back to t. Um, this one here, a three sub two, means I'm going two thirds right around, and then do another two thirds right and then another two-thirds and then I'm back so let's look at uh, you know there's this case where I have the spiral having a sense like this right so it has a handedness going up that way right so I want you to remember that now let's look at the case where we pick two-thirds t, and this should be tau, tau equals two-thirds t. Well, the initial is shown here, where again I move over, you know, here's 120 degrees, right, so I'm going over 120 degrees, and then I translate not just one tau, but two taus, sorry, not just a third t, but two thirds t, which is um, you know one tau, but it, the tau equals right. Then I do the same thing here. Rotate another 120 degrees, and then I go up two taus. Well, two, <laughs> sorry for keep on making this. Two of the old taus, but I'm not doing tau equals one third anymore. I'm doing two thirds tau, right? So it's two thirds of translation vector up, right, and so on. Now, remember that the translation vector, despite the fact that I'm doing this around this axis, the translation vector is still invariant, right? It just produces whatever motif I have T up. So if you look at this one here, this is a third, two thirds, three thirds. So this is T. So we have a problem in that, well, there has to be a motif up here. So there's two things going on there. I start off with a motif here, and I have my screw axis, but then we can't forget that translation vectors translates all these guys up uh, on a normal translation vector anyway. And so we represent that, well, I've represented that here with these orange blocks. You can see that um, uh, we need to have this guy produced T up from there, and it's there. This one has to be T up from there, right? And it's a little bit harder to see this one, but you could go T down. So this one is T up from here. So the orange were inserted with translation. And now you should see a very interesting pattern, which is now the sense, right, is going the opposite way that the other one did. So this one, which has the opposite hand in this, came from 3, 2. The other one, which kind of went like that, is uh, 3, 1. And so what you see is that uh, depending on the value of tau, you can have opposite handedness in the sense of the rotation. Describe all this, there of course has to be some sort of notation uh, to take this uh, into account. And so what's transpired is that we already know that this is a threefold axis, right? Well, a threefold axis that's a screw axis with a tau of one third is written like this, where these guys come up there. So if you think about these things as flying behind some sort of rotation, you can imagine that if these things were uh, dangly things on a triangle corner, if it spins to the right, these things would be in this position, right? They would flail to the, so it's kind of senses a clockwise, I mean, just the way that this is, it's just one way you can remember it. Because the notation for the opposite is this one. And that one has sort of the opposite 
sense it kind of has that feeling that it rotates you know this way and of course that's why they're written that way because they have the opposite sense because of the of the uh, uh what we just described here that the motifs go in the opposite direction so we'll finish there and then we'll uh, do one last thing because this shows you that the 3 1 and 3 2 have opposite sense but we need to look at an even fold axis like a four uh, fold screw axis in order to, to show one more feature and we'll do that in the next lecture